Now for today's program. Yoni Avi Batat is a multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, and composer specializing in contemporary and traditional Jewish music from Eastern Europe and the Middle East. He maintains an active performance schedule across the country, as well as in Canada, Israel, Portugal, and Italy, playing violin, viola, and oud in collaborative and interdisciplinary projects spanning a wide range of styles. Most recently, Yoni toured nationally as an actor and violinist with the Tony award-winning musical The Band's Visit. In 2015, Yoni founded his own Yiddish jazz band called Two Shekel Swing. Yoni works as a song leader, facilitating musical prayer in Jewish communities, and is a fellow with Hadar's Rising Song Institute. Joe Alterman is a jazz musician and has performed at many world-renowned venues, including the Kennedy Center, Lincoln Center, and New York's Blue Note, where he has opened many times for Ramsey Lewis. He has also performed with Houston Person, Les McCann, Dick Gregory, and his own trio. Joe has released four critically acclaimed albums, including his most recent in 2021 entitled The Upside of Down, Live at Birdland. Joe has also written liner notes to three jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra with Wynton Marsalis albums. In addition to his piano work, Joe is the executive director of Narana Na Concert and Culture Series, which celebrates Jewish contributions to music and the arts. Please welcome Yoni Avi Batat and Joe Alterman. Hey. Thank you, Suzanne. Hey, Yoni. It's good to see you. Hey. Man, I'm <laughs> great to I'm be look, here. <laughs> yes. Been looking forward to this chat for a while. We have a lot here. So fortunately, this is a four-hour conversation. No, I'm just kidding. But we, we have a lot. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I I love your new album, Fragments. And I know a lot about fragments is, you know, tapping into memories that you can't quite remember. But uh before we got into that, I thought it'd be uh uh, maybe maybe fun to dive into some memories first that you do remember, you know, and so I was really curious, you know, your journey up until now, you know, like, how did you first fall in love with music? Um, I'm just curious, you know, really what your musical journey leading up to Fragments has really been. Yeah. Um, so I started playing violin when I was four. Uh, and, um, I remember practicing every morning with my mom. She would wake up early and, uh, practice with me. Uh, I loved music from a very young age and my parents did a really good job pushing me to, um, to practice and to, and to keep advancing and, and to be ambitious. And, um, eventually, uh, I just fell in love with it. It started to become, a, a part of me. I, I started playing, uh, improvising when I was, when I was a kid, I had a lot of teachers that encouraged that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also I played in a klezmer band, an intergenerational klezmer band, kind of a pickup band called the New Haven Capella. Um, mm. And that was really, uh, really a important formative experience of like getting my feet wet in Jewish music. I started playing in synagogues. I started, uh, yeah, I started writing my own stuff. I, I started uh, going to an arts high school. Um, mm. Basically, little by little, I just started to unravel and open up. And, and before I knew it, um, I was studying music in college and uh, attending different festivals and. Mm. Um, yeah, eventually I did a master's in music. Uh, so I, I've been on a, a long journey with music and, and uh, it's it's really nourished me uh, along the way. Totally. Did you have any initial influences or musicians that really made a big impression on you? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, one, I, I, one, of the, one of the first uh, jazz albums I ever listened to actually was um, Stéphane Grappelli, uh, mm. An Afternoon in Paris. Uh, that was an album that my parents sent me at camp, actually. I had, mm. uh, I was like at sleepaway camp and they sent me like a care package with a CD that I put in my disc man and I listened to it with headphones. And uh, that was that was one of those first albums that I really remember. Um, mm. Yeah, actually, a lot of jazz artists are coming up right now. Avishai Cohen, the bass player, uh, was uh, really influential to me, too. Uh, uh, his album, Continuo. I actually got to see him live for the first time. Um, mm recently uh and it was really uh really a special experience to be able to uh to finally get to meet and well not meet but at least hear live uh, one of my my musical idols totally well i guess you know stefan grappelli i'm assuming you heard klezmer music before you heard stefan grappelli do you yeah, think for sure <laughs> yeah do you think hearing stefan grappelli and being drawn to his sound and his music was aided in part because you are already familiar with klezmer music. Do you feel like, you know, his sound is kind of related to that sound, even though it's not that sound specifically? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it was interesting. I think I probably started Klezmer around the same time that I started listening to Stefan Grappelli. Mm -hmm. And I think both both of those outlets just really felt like a really uh, wildly um, groundbreaking sound that a violin can make, you know, playing classical music and, and in a classical training. Mm -hmm. There's just a very specific type of sound, a different, 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 a very specific aesthetic of what's beautiful. Um, mm. You know, a little bit of grit, a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of bow noise, a little bit of like a wide vibrato or slides and stuff like that. That's not as aesthetic in classical music. And, and I think both in Klezmer and in Stefan Grappelli's playing, I mm -hmm. found it to be really liberating to be able to say, wow, um, there, there, there's so many more options for how you can express uh, the instrument. Mm. Oh, totally. Man, that's, it's special stuff. Well, I guess, you know, I was curious, you know, there's so many elements that go into your music, you know, um, your Iraqi background, your Jewish background, your love of music. I'm just curious, like, what came first? Or like, when did you discover, you know, that you loved music versus you were Jewish or you're Iraqi? Like, how does this tie into everything that you are? Yeah, that's the whole story, honestly. Yeah. That's like, the, <laughs> that's, that's everything. Um, I, I would say I had a very strong Jewish identity growing up. Um, we had Shabbat every week. We would sing songs around the table. Mm -hmm. um, some of my earliest memories are of Iraqi Judaism in a certain sense. I, my, my grandfather, Avraham, would speak Iraqi Jewish Arabic to my dad, and uh, he would come over for Shabbat dinner all the time. We would make Iraqi Jewish foods. Um, mm. We would also sing Le Chad Odi, uh, like that, that piyut that we sing on Friday nights uh, in our house to the melody that my dad grew up hearing in Jerusalem where he grew up, which is also a Middle Eastern Mizrahi melody for Le Chad Odi. Mm. And so like those are some of like the formative sounds, but, but really what I learned really quickly is that it was kind of on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the food, the language, a little bit of it, I never really understood the language, I just heard it. Um, mm. So it was kind of a surface level and also the melodies. It was one melody that I knew out of mm -hmm. infinite melodies that exist and, and that that would be part of uh, an Iraqi community synagogue. So mm -hmm. I grew up going to obviously not an Iraqi synagogue. I went to a Solomon Schechter Jewish day school. Um, I learned Hebrew and I, you know, was bar mitzvah at a Chabad and I prayed with with a lot of Ashkenazi and, and really just my whole community was 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 Ashkenazi. And so that's really what um, that really what formed the content of my Jewish knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though in my heart, I, I had this connection to Iraqi culture, um, what I felt outside and in my community and what was supported and built up by my community was more the Ashkenazi culture. And I didn't really feel like there was much space for the um, Mizrahi, Iraqi part. And so little by little, I, I, uh, I started playing klezmer and then I had my own klezmer band when I was 16. I, I created my own, uh, me and my buddies uh, created a klezmer band, really as a like a business venture. We went out and we tried to play uh, the bar and bat mitzvahs our, our younger siblings' friends, and like we had like a little package deal that we would uh, put together, and and then we would play a hora and then a cocktail hour, and that, that was like package? formative. That was, was the it? package, yeah, <laughs> cocktail hour and hora. Nice. For like, uh, I don't know, too little money. It was really <laughs> <laughs> when we were 16, we were, we were all for it. Um, mm. So that was, that was also really formative and an important part of my Jewish identity was really my musical voice formed around this klezmer voice. Um, mm. That was really what I had an outlet for. I was a good violinist. Mm. There were outlets to learn klezmer. And so I went for it. And mm. um, it really entered in me the, the, Krechts and and cracks of the voice of Yiddish music entered into my violin playing, and it's to this day still feels like a really intrinsic part of of my musical expression. Uh, mm. Even though I've been trying to uh, unearth uh, different options for expression based on other parts of my identity. Yeah, I mean, I know I've I've read a little uh, a, a bunch about you, and I know you know you've talked about a bit about how there aren't there are many resources to find out about. Ashkenazic music and Eastern European music, but there's not that many resources to learn about Mizrahi music and Iraqi Jewish heritage, things like that. Do you think you were inspired to, to explore this partially because there are not many resources or just because you, you were really fascinated by it? You know what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, it feels like, uh, yeah, what, what you're saying is right on. Where's the, where's the center for 
Arab Judaism in America? You know, where's the, where's, if I want to learn Arabic as a Jew in America, where do I go? There's no uh, Yiddish book center equivalent of the, you know, that there's an, and, and it's wonderful that those things don't exist. And, it, and I've benefited greatly from, for example, YIVO and the Yiddish book center and Yiddish New York. I, I participated in Yiddish New York one year. Um, mm. All of those things are really rich and powerful, and I think they're amazing. I, I don't know if it's the, really the reason that I that motivated me to mm. to start exploring this music. I think really what motivated me is just a desire to draw close to my roots. Um, and then what was required was a lot of labor. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, 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 what was required was ex a, a great investment of time, travel, money. Um, uh, yeah blood, sweat, and tears, it feels like, to, to, to really learn the style. When I was 16, I was on a trip to, to Israel, and, and I my grandfather took me to Or Yehuda, which is a neighborhood that started off as a transit camp for Iraqi Jews coming from Baghdad to Israel. Mm. Um, and the conditions were very bad then, and, and it, little by little, it developed into a city. And now it's, it's a city that has, it's a little bit outside of Tel Aviv, and it has a lot of Mizrahi Jews and a lot of Iraqi Jews. Um, and so he took me to that city, uh, and I had, uh, my first ever lesson in Makam. Um, Makam is this system of musical modes that's used across the Arab world and also in Turkey in, in a different way, slightly. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really blew my mind it, as a, as a 16 year old kind of music nerd, I was really excited by this new idea that there could be notes that don't exist in Western music. We have microtones, we have these 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 really specific exact uh, notes that that fall between like the black and white keys of the piano and and to me that really excited me because it was an opportunity for more expression more nuanced expression uh, to be honest first it sounded really bad to me it sounded like it was out of tune because of my uh, uh, classical training and then when I learned to listen with the right uh, ears I learned to really love it and really learned to appreciate what it what it offers uh, hmm. as a musician as far as more colors and, and more tools so really that's what got me excited excited really about 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 the music was how a i thought it was really cool and hmm. b it was a part of me i was like oh wait this is this goes along with all these other things that were consolidated and and confined to my home growing up hmm. but i actually want some tools around the musical language and also around arabic language to be able to bring that part of me out into the world mm -hmm. man well i know you have your your oud there i don't know if you can yeah. <laughs> demonstrate any of this stuff but you know I'm, I'm curious i'm sure there are musicians in the audience you know uh i'm curious like what are the the names like say you're playing there's an f and a g and you're playing notes in between like an f and an f sharp like do you have names for these notes like is there anything you could yeah. you know, explain to the musicians here about this <laughs> Yeah, you ready? The note between an F and an F sharp is called an F half sharp. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there's a there's a, a musical mode that uses an F half sharp called Rost. Mm. So this note is the kind of uh, what some might call sour. I would call it like really uh, rich with uh, with uh, expression. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, this this is an oud for uh, for those who have never seen this instrument before. I'll, I'll try and bring it a little closer so you can, you can yeah. see a little bit more of the details of it. Um, it's some people call it the piano of the Middle East because it's this really um, it's found everywhere in Arab wow. music and in Turkish music. Um, and so so like a lot of houses will just have an oud lying around, and and it's mm. it's sort of the basic instrument for accompanying yourself as a singer. Uh, in all of this repertoire, and it doesn't have frets, which mm. is what allows us to kind of reach those more specific intonation of those quarter tones between um, between the notes. The same thing with violin. Violin also doesn't have frets, so so it really gives us a uh, uh, a lot of power to to be expressive with that intonation. Something that sadly pianists don't have access to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where is that oud from? Or is it? Is am I pronouncing? I know you said. Oh, you said oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, oud, it has like a guttural ayin at the beginning, oud. Ah. 
Uh, mm. It's a tricky one. You'll work on it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> this is oh, yeah. this ode was made in in Syria. Uh, I bought mm. it in Haifa, uh, mm. and. Yeah, the, the, the maker was not a known maker. He was kind of an amateur maker, uh, and it was restored several times in its lifetime. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's become it's become a, a really important part of me, this instrument, which which I learned about for the first time when I was 16 at that trip I was describing to mm. Mor Yehuda. Um, and I took a lesson in Makam, and I held an oud for the first time. Someone just like handed it to me right here. I mm. went, oh, okay. And like, you know, I, I did, you know, like any musician likes to tinker around on a different instrument. Uh, I, I tinkered around on it and I said, oh, this is cool. I like this. And, and my grandfather actually bought me an ode when I was 16. Oh, and so nice. I went back to the States and I would noodle around with it. I would play sometimes in Shabbat services in whatever way I knew how. I didn't know a lot mm -hmm. about the musical style then, but I used it the way I, I felt I could use it. And, and over the years, I, I filled that out with, with more knowledge and training in, in Makam music. Mm. through college and also through opportunities afterwards and really i've been on a journey since then that was you know what 15 years ago uh mm. to 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 learn what there is to learn about this musical style mm. and um and and really to feel like i can my goal was always to feel like i had a native command of of the makam and the and the instrument and what I've learned very slowly is that that's never going to be possible and uh that's sort of a part of this album story, uh, mm. if it's okay for me to start leading into the album. Of course, yeah. Uh, really, I, I decided that as I was, um, I, I, I knew that I had been studying this music for a while. I had a lot of ideas brewing in my head about uh, melodic uh, melodic ideas and, and how I could build it into songs and bring different parts of myself together. Mm. But I felt like so self-conscious. I felt this big block because I, I knew that it, it would never be as native to me as the krechts of Yiddish music were in mm. my violin playing, because I grew up with those. And this I came to at age 16, which to me felt like really, really old compared mm. to, you know, the rest of my, uh, my musical training. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I felt like, who am I to represent this music to people who don't know much about it? I'm going to be the one who shares with them Arab music or Iraqi music for the first time. And I'm not even feeling like I'm a master myself. Mm. How do I get past that? Um, and so that was sort of the framework in which I was like, I know I want to release an album. I have all these ideas, but what do I do with it? What do I do with this big problem? It's like, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I'm enough, um, which mm -hmm. I think a very human experience that a lot of people can relate to. Um, and so ultimately I, I had to take that, that roadblock and make it into a part of, a part of the story of the album. Um, mm -hmm. so I started talking more and thinking more about why don't I have, why didn't I have access to this music? Mm -hmm. Um, what what do I wish I knew about my ancestors? Mm. Um, what What is this experience of feeling distant from something that is part of me in a really strong way, but also feeling like I'm an outsider to my own culture? Mm -hmm. um, and so little by little, I started uncovering what that experience is like and, and realizing that it's a human experience that a lot of people can relate to, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have the information about their ancestors or or, or the exact content of what, what sort of rituals they used to do or what their lives looked like in different places, no matter where your family came from, Jewish or not. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like this was an opportunity to really tell my story and my, the whole of my story, not hide the fact that I'm, I'm still figuring it out. Just to say, right, right. look, I'm still figuring it out. And um, by the way, I bet some of you listeners are also still figuring it out too. And, and ultimately I ended up calling it Fragmentation, which is where the, the, the name of the album Fragments came from. And different tracks of the album explore different levels of fragmentation and different, different ways of trying to break, to fill in the holes of the fragmentation with imagination, with, with the senses, to try and reach a level of wholeness and acceptance of our own fragmentation uh, is really sort of the, the journey of the album. Mm. Would you want to... Uh play something for for yeah, everyone sure. to kind of demonstrate um, yeah yeah of course I'll, I'll play for you um i'll play for you a little bit of the song vapor uh vapor to me basically as i was conceiving of the album different songs were gonna get through to memory and ancestry and in different ways and i knew mm -hmm. i wanted one song to be about language and like mm -hmm. the many languages of my ancestors and the way language even in the sounds of the language really contains a lot of information and uh, beauty of, mm -hmm. of, of that culture. 
So I set out to write a song that combined Arabic, Yiddish, and Hebrew texts, which mm -hmm. are the three languages of my ancestors. Um, and I had some awesome collaborators, Anthony Mordechai Tzvi Russell, uh, who's a friend of mine, an amazing singer. Mm -hmm. He collaborated with me to take all, we basically took all of these poems. I went searching for Arabic poems. He brought in some Yiddish programs. I, I brought in some, some Hebrew lines from the Sidur and we made this big Google doc of like 20 pages mm -hmm. of all of these poems. And he really helped me prune them away and to make, to, to tell a story, combining mm -hmm. different poems to, to tell a story. Um, and so I'm going to sing a little bit of this song. I'll sing about half of it, not the whole thing. Um, and the idea is that it, it's, it's about the, the, the lyrics in Arabic start by saying, you went away, but remained in me mm. and thus became my peace and happiness in separation, separation left me and I witnessed the unknown. So to me, it's like thinking about my ancestors, thinking about the Arabic language, thinking about all these memory that mm -hmm. went away, but somehow is inside me subconsciously. Mm. Um, and then I paired that with this poem. So that was written by a Sufi poet named Halaj, mm. uh, who was a contemporary of Rumi um, back in the, you know, 10th century. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a really old poem it's combined with a Yiddish poem from the 1960s, which says, which was written by Arne Seitlin. And, and the poem says, I know that in this world, no one needs me, me, a word beggar in the Jewish graveyard. Who needs a poem, especially in Yiddish? Mm. So to me, that was like, you went away and within me. And like, that's a really beautiful part of my essence mm. uh, to this other side of it is like, who needs this, mm -hmm. this, uh, this, this, this intangible uh, quality uh, and especially language, you know, who, wh what is it good for? It's mm. we're just nothing in the expanse of time. And that's why I brought in this line from Ecclesiastes, um, which says in Hebrew, for most of our deeds are meaningless and the days of our lives are like vapor before you. Mm. So I'll start by playing uh, a little bit of, of vapor. <laughs> Actually, a, a, mu a music video for this one that, that has some footage of the studio and, and some the lyrics translated as you go, so you can can look that up when this is all over. And, yes, uh, hopefully yeah. everyone will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking as you were playing, you know, if I make an album, I I go in, you know, play piano, uh, take the best take, and make a couple edits or something. But you learned like all these languages, you know, so much went into to this production. I was just curious if you could speak a little bit about the actual making of this album i mean there's so much involved yeah wow so much yeah. involved yeah especially <laughs> as someone who doesn't speak arabic trying to write songs in arabic it's really <laughs> hard even to know uh, you know and i'm working on arabic i i i've come a long mm. way with my arabic but it's it's a big project and it's a beautiful language with a rich history and so many variations and regional mm. variations and, and literature and, and and i'm just breaking the surface so mm. as someone who who doesn't speak the language and 
uh, but trying to source poetry even was on the first mm. on the most basic level was really hard um i relied on a, a lot of academics uh, mm. scholars who who write about literature and poetry in different languages uh one scholar Lital levy another one um reuven sneer mm. these people Basically, I, I read through some of their writings, some of their papers and books, and was able to, and they had some of these poems in translation. And so I was able to say, mm. oh, that's really beautiful. I'd love that line. But then all I had was the English. I had to find the Arabic mm. somehow, uh, which was its own project. Uh, in one case, um, there was a great citation. It was perfect because scholars are really good at citing. And they, mm. she cited, Lightly Talavi cited the book. And, the, and I found that there were only like two libraries in the States that had it. And one was at Yale University. So I sent my friend, who was a Yale student, to go into the stacks and pick out the book. And, and, wow. and finally, I was able, I finally remember the moment I had it in my hand. It took months until mm. I finally had it in my hand. And then I opened to the page and I, my Arabic, I felt was like, was good enough that if I, if I looked at the page, I would find the part that had this one line in it. And um, I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. And I was like, so dismayed. I, I was, I, I felt so sad because I was like working on my Arabic and I was like, I know I would be able to, to, to and, and so I went to a friend, an uh, Arabic speaker, and, and I asked, can you help me? What's going on? And he said, oh, did you try reversing the numbers of the citation? And I was like, oh, and so I looked on page 86 and page, instead of page 68, and there it was right there. And it was, uh, it was like a real moment of, uh, of a catharsis and, uh, and, uh, and satisfaction to be able to find it. Um, but that's just to find one text, one little line for one little poem. And so many of the songs on this album uh, involved stories like that of trying to find and, and, and uh, also even just the pronunciation. You know, I had mm. people who helped me the, learn how to pronounce, pronounce some of these songs. Arabic is a language with, that has unwritten diacritic, unwritten vowel sounds and endings also. So mm. I had to bring someone who really knew what they were doing to say, okay, I can read Arabic letters and, and that's fine. But mm -hmm. she was able to be like, oh, you have to add an E at the end of this letter, uh, this word, and this one grammatically needs an in, and then this one needs an U. And I wouldn't have mm. known any of those things. So I really relied on a, on a network of people to help me put this together. And I think ultimately that's a metaphor for, for what the album's about too, is mm -hmm. that I, I, I care about these languages and I want to sing in these languages because it feels good in my mouth. Uh, mm. And I can't, I don't have the tools to, to access all of the languages and I'm working on building them. But in the meantime, should I just give up? Like, no, I, mm. I need to, I need to still be able to say something. And so um, the process of finding the text is in my mind, a real metaphor for uh, my journey to just like self-acceptance and, and recognizing my own limitations and fragmentation. Totally. We you know, I guess, I mean, people always refer to music as being a language. And I know to non-musicians, it's sometimes hard to explain that. And I guess, you know, knowing so many spoken languages, I was just curious how learning the musical language, you know, is similar to learning an like a spoken language or, you know, especially improvisation. Is that a another, you know, language? I'm just curious, you know, really about learning musical language versus, you know, spoken language, if you can I speak that to that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I just thought of a lot of parallels. Actually, I hadn't thought of it. I think there's a lot of parallels, uh, especially with maqam. Like, maqam mm -hmm. is more than just a series of notes. It's mm -hmm. more than just, like, modes, major, minor, Phrygian, mixed, I mean, whatever. It's, mm -hmm. it's also contains within it a lot of, like, characteristic phrases that, like, oh, when you're in maqam rast or bayat, you should play this kind of thing. Da, 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 A phrase like that. Like... Mm -hmm. For one example, there's hundreds of them. Um, and so to me, it's like a language also. Like you can know the individual words, but if you don't know like the way that people tend to put them together mm. in that language, and by the way, that's regional, like even within America, like we have the same words, but like people in the South might put them together in a different way than, than people in the North do um, mm -hmm. or on the East Coast or whatever. Um, I feel like there's a lot of similarities there and, and, and also regional differences within music. And, and this particular music, Makam, is a vast, mm -hmm. uh, a vast sea of, of opportunity with a lot of regional differences. People in Iraq play Makam and have different Makams than people in Turkey or Syria or mm -hmm. Yemen or Morocco or Egypt or, you know, any, any, anywhere in the Middle East. Um, but they all have this... Uh, language that ties it together like maybe it's the words like if we mm. want to make like a metaphor or a parallel mm. um but how how you string the words together is, is is like a whole grammar and also a cultural phenomenon so i feel like 
Yeah, you gotta memorize words. You gotta you gotta learn a lot of words. You gotta listen to a lot of music. But really, the best way is just to practice, is to talk to people. That's mm -hmm. how you learn a language, and and that's that's been my experience of um, of learning uh, makam as well. Because mm. uh, basically, I've just been playing with people, and I've been writing my own music, and and writing my own music and bringing it to it, my teacher. Uh, that's been a huge thing. Mm. That, that and he would say, oh yeah, this is great. This is this is a classic hijaz phrase. That's the name of a makam. This is a classic phrase for hijaz. Great job. Mm. And he say, I don't know where this is going. This is kind of new age, which doesn't mean it's bad. But he'll say, okay, this is kind of like a. You, you invented this. This is not part of the tradition. And it's really helpful feedback for me. So, so like, it's like going out and trying to speak a language and not being afraid of embarrassing yourself. I think that's the best way to learn a language mm -hmm. is, to, is to make mistakes and, and to really try it. Yeah, it's, I can relate in the music world for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got to be brave and get out there. Yeah, man. Well, um, um, where's my, uh, I'm so sorry, I lost my, my train of thought. Um, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess, you know, I was really fascinated. You know, I didn't know much about this, this history um, of Jews and musicians, mus musical Jews in Iraq. I mean, I don't want you to give away everything, but I was just curious if you could share some of the, you know, fascinating things you know or learned about that, that history. Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say. Basically, being a musician, especially an instrumentalist, was was almost all of the instrumentalists in Baghdad up through the 1940s mm. were Jewish. There were very few non-Jewish musicians in Baghdad, and the population of Jews in Baghdad was huge, hundreds of thousands. Mm. And so Jews were an important part of like the society and cultural production of that place. Uh, even the pop music that was sung and heard by Jewish and non-Jewish Arabs around the Middle East, many of them were reigned by Jews. One in particular is Salah al-Kuwaiti. Um, he was an Iraqi Jew writing in Baghdad whose songs were sung by some of the most uh, beloved singers across the Arab world. And one of his songs is on my album also. Mm. I did a cover of his song, Hava Mu'in Saf Minnak, which means um, it's, not, what, it's not fair of you to, to, to leave me. Mm. Um, the song is written about a woman, but but I'm sorry, I'm sort of recontextualizing it as it's not fair for these memories to leave me. It's not fair that I don't have the Arab Arabic language. Uh, what will I do when people ask me about you? And mm -hmm. and so I, I sort of reimagined it that way. The, and when I think about that storied history and, and the way that Iraqi Jews are, and there's a huge tradition of even in the synagogue and and using the same musical language of makam in the synagogue and, and, and in prayer and in uh, different rituals, it really makes me uh, so excited for the Jews. <laughs> it makes me feel like, so, like the, the, there's so much opportunity here and, and, there's, and there's so much more possibility within Jewish expression than what most people in the States are aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's become a big part of my mission is to say, hey, Arabic language, that's a Jewish language mm -hmm. and, and Arabic Makam and this musical style, this is Jewish expression. Um, mm. and, and I think it's not often thought of that way, but I think that's a really important uh, realization for, especially for American Jews to, to, to realize uh, is that there's so much more than uh, klezmer and you know ch chicken soup and matzo balls. Uh, Judaism mm. looks uh, really diverse and, and, and it's, it's just such an opportunity to bring um, diverse voices and and more interesting and and uh, exciting. Uh, not that Klezmer is not exciting. I love it, mm -hmm. as as you've heard already me say. But but mm -hmm. much more interesting and exciting uh, opportunities into into Jewish expression. Totally, I mean, there's there's so much out there, and I guess you know. I mean, I know in the states, a lot of the music that was written in the '50s and around that time is still like you know so synonymous with our world and society. I was just curious, do you know if any of much or any of the music written or performed by, you know, these Jewish musicians in Iraq is uh, back then is still uh, present and, you know, or popular in, in today's society there? 100%. There's a yeah. song, yeah, I'll even play a little bit of it. There's yeah, a song yeah. called Fogel Nacha. Fogel mm. Nacha. guy 
Saleh al Kuwaiti, and mm. I have Palestinian friends uh, that I've that I've that I've been talking to recently that they that they know that song. They say, "Oh yeah, I love that song. Um, that's like a Palestinian folk song, right?" Uh, and, wow. and I'll say, "No, actually, it was written by a Jew in Baghdad, <laughs> like a hundred years ago. Can you believe it?" Um, and it's like a really fun moment to be able to like pull pull together um, this music that joins so many different people. Um, mm. And I really think that's something that that people don't realize is is that there's there's so much shared musical memory between Arabs and Arab Jews, uh, Middle mm -hmm. Eastern Jews. Um, my dad grew up uh, sneaking into the living room when his parents were hosting guests and they were playing reel to reels of Um Kultum, which is amazing, amazing, uh, iconic singer of Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and Um Kultum was heard in households everywhere in the Middle East, from Morocco all the way to Bahrain, you know, like mm. everywhere was listening to Um Kultum. Whether you were Jewish or Muslim or Arab it, or, or, or Christian, it didn't matter. That, mm -hmm. that was like a, 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 a musical memory and, and repertoire that brought all those people together. Mm. So for me, it's really powerful to think about that and, and powerful to think people love to make distinctions, but wh where, are the, where are the commonalities? And I, I think especially when you think about memory and you think about culture and you think about uh, childhoods and even, even, even uh, you know, I could go on and on about things mm -hmm. that, that Middle Eastern Jews and Arabs share, which is so much to me, uh, even mm -hmm. cultural things about how to welcome the guest and, and the types of foods they make um, uh, and the dress. And there, there was a lot of things that were really shared because in Iraq until for, for thousands of years, really, um, Jews were an integral part of society and they were very integrated, uh, mm -hmm. even if they, they had different cultures and if, if they were not to say that they, there weren't differences between people, but, but they, mm -hmm. they were seen as an important part of society and lived in peace with mm -hmm. their Muslim neighbors for a really long time. So yeah. I, I like to look at that and, and see it as an inspiration. Totally. Well, I just had two questions before we open it up to, you know, uh, two more questions yeah. before we open it up to the, uh, to the audience. I was curious, you know, I see. There's so many elements that make up your music. And I was just curious, I've seen it, you know, I mean, I, we, we both know that the genres of music were created not by the musicians. So, you know, I know that, uh, you know, I've seen your music be called Jewish music before. I'm just curious if you agree with that or if there is any genre you feel comfortable putting your music in or how you would ex describe your music, you know? Yeah. I think it's Jewish music, of course. It's mm -hmm. just as much Arab music as it is Jewish music. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's Arab Jewish music. It's mm -hmm. uh, Middle Eastern Jewish music. It's Mizrahi, Mizrahi music. It's, um, yeah, I think in a lot of ways, this album in particular I'm talking mm -hmm. about right now, yeah. um, my goal was really to be true to the musical form. Uh, mm -hmm. On the album, you'll hear traditional instruments. You're not going to hear any electronic instruments or like drum set or anything like that. You hear uh, a hand drum, a hand tambourine, a frame drum, a kanun, which is like a zither, a harp that's played on the lap. You mm -hmm. might hear, uh, you'll hear the oud, you'll hear uh, a, a, a reed flute. That's really all of these instruments are, are quintessential classic instruments. And even the way I was going about writing them, I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. I was actually really trying to steep uh in this tradition and 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 write tunes whether that was successful or not is a different question but write tunes that that people would say oh yeah this sounds like a classic to mm. this makam uh, mm. that was really my goal because i want to be able to learn how to write in those styles and to be able to really honor the tradition it comes from and the genre itself mm. um my next album who knows but but this one at least was very much intentionally designed to to be rooted strongly in that style and giving a lot of respect for the tradition mm -hmm. that it came from. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care what you call it, but it's yeah, definitely yeah. Jewish music and yeah, yeah. it's definitely uh, a world music, you know, is a comfortable, you know, label mm -hmm. for it. Uh, there's elements of jazz in it too, though, you know, in improvisation exists in this music mm -hmm. as a tradition. It's a very different type of improvisation than jazz. You know, right. in jazz, you're playing over changes, um, chord changes, and, and, and in in this music, there's not chord changes to play from. And in fact, harmony isn't really a factor in this music at all. Mm -hmm. Like the way the melodies are constructed, they're not constructed around harmony. They're constructed mm -hmm. around melodic figures. And what mm -hmm. that does is that really opens up a lot of expression for um, phrases that are odd lengths and like mm -hmm. um, uh, long run on uh, 
beautiful lines that just keep going and going and going without the separation and markation of harmony that says right, right. this belongs here and this belongs here and this one. these phrases just go and go and go and go and mm. so so that's that was really something i was trying to capture in the music as well as like the opportunity to to really uh to to think in a different way musically mm -hmm. and not let harmony be the thing that's leading me from one way to another that's beautiful. I love that. It's one of the things yeah. I love about Louis Armstrong. He, you know, improvises off the melody, not just the chord yeah. change. And I think totally. that's a reason so many people love him and, and connect to the music. So, I, you know, I think, um, well, I just had one more, one more question before we open it up, which was, you know, I'm really uh, fascinating hearing you kind of talk about this, like, outsider, feeling like an outsider or not feeling like a master. And, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, scholar Ben Sidrin, but he's he's a great a musician and kind of scholar on the topic of American contribution, Jewish American contributions to American music. And he often mm -hmm. talks about how many of the, uh, the, um, the Jews involved in American music were kind of like the first hipsters because they were outsiders but they, they knew what was going on in the inside and had a way of expressing it, but were not a part of it. And I was just curious, is that how you kind of, I mean, because you're expressing things that are happening on the inside. You may not feel a part of it, but you've, to me, it's, it seems like you feel like a good messenger of the things that are happening on the inside. Um, is this correct? And I'm curious too, you know, yeah. if there is a place in music where you don't feel like an outsider necessarily, is there a, a you know, a musical style where you feel totally, you know, I, I can relate to this as a musician too. So I'm just, you know, also asking this, uh, you know, personally. Well, yeah. I've been spending a lot of energy thinking about how I'm an outsider. So it's good. It's a good, uh, it's a good <laughs> opportunity to, to think about it where I'm not an outsider. Um, I think, well, first of all, I think, I think there's, there's a, there's a theory of, maybe a psychological theory that you want to understand something about society, you have to look at the margins. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and I really think, um, I really think what I'm bringing, uh, even though I'm an outsider is recognition mm -hmm. for a lot of Mizrahi Jews, uh, and even Jews of color, Latin Jews around, especially in America who feel like their experience isn't represented, uh, mm -hmm. in the Jewish spaces, uh, that they're mm -hmm. a part of. Um, and so I'm, I'm feeling very lucky that I have the language and tools as a musician in my own way to be able to talk about this and, and to bring, bring the issue to the forefront and, and to by expressing myself and by, uh, telling my story and mm. sharing my music, I am making space for those people in a different way. And, and my dream is that the next generation can grow up with more awareness of, mm. of the different types of Jewish expression and be able to bring them in and not not have to feel as much like an outsider mm. um to go to go to your question about where do, do i not feel like an outsider? i feel like w when i'm just hanging and jamming with friends and not thinking about what style i'm music i mean that that's the most at home that's like I, it could be anything um yeah. mm. and whatever i bring is right uh and and ultimately that's true about music in general whatever the notes that you and then improvisation you know not to, you know of course the notes mm -hmm. that you play are the notes that you played you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, there's no, mis like there's mistakes. There's things that you didn't intend maybe, but whatever you mm -hmm. played is the music. Um, and mm -hmm. so like the more I can root into that sense of freedom, the more I can feel, uh, a sense of belonging and a sense of, of not being an outsider of just being, this is me, this is what I am. And, uh, and, uh, it, whatever I played is, is, is the music that it was supposed to be. That's great. Yeah, man. What a great, what a great way to, tr uh, to transition to, to some audience questions, but this has been a treat great. speaking with you really. Suzanne, thank you, you so come much, back? Joe. Oh, of course. Thank, thank you both so much. Uh, before we get to questions, uh, Yoni, do you want to play something else for us? Everybody really enjoyed the first piece oh, that you sure. played. Um, what else can I play? Um, you know what I'll do? I'll play a little bit of, um, of any of a traditional Iraqi piece, not um not my own composition. This is a piyut, which is a liturgical poem called El Eliyahu, and it's uh, sung traditionally after Havdalah because it's uh, Eliyahu Anavi is someone that we like to bring into the Havdalah uh, moment of of saying goodbye to Shabbat and bringing in a new week. Uh, and so this is a traditional Iraqi piyut. The melody I didn't write, the words I didn't write, but. Uh, I, I created my own version for this for the album. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to share that one. Goes. Shabbat shalom. 
Fantastic, fantastic. And for, for those who are interested in Yoni's album um, fragments, I've put a link in the chat to that and I will send it after the program as well. Uh, someone wanted to know, uh, what was your dad's response to your interest in um, Iraqi Jewishness? Oh, he was thrilled. I, he, he continues to be thrilled, I think. Um, he he, uh, he he's very proud of his Iraqi Jewish identity, and 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 um, he, it was also so interesting to to feel the the flow of memory and, and the passage of of subconscious memory and songs. And every once in a while, I'll learn a song somewhere else in in, in the world where I'm trying uh, from one of my teachers, or, and I'll say, "Hey, Dad, do you know this song?" And a lot of times he'll be like, "No, I don't know it, but cool." And a lot of times he'll say. Yeah, I do know that song. What is that song? Uh, and and that, that's kind of a really cool way of saying, oh wait, there's something interesting about memory where 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 music can actually bring us in. Uh, and it's been so interesting to see what he does remember, what he doesn't remember. He also experienced, you know, growing up in 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 Israel, a real erasure of his Iraqi identity. He he didn't want to be seen in public. You know, I'm speaking for him, but I I've heard enough from him that I, I feel like I can say this accurately. You know, he didn't want to be heard in public speaking Arabic to his parents. Um, because that's the language of the enemy, uh, and and that and that that's a way of marking uh, enemy from friend and and uh, family from other, uh, and so and it wasn't cool, you know. That they used to make fun of his last name; they'd call him Batata, which means sweet potato, uh, <laughs> and uh, and and so so I actually really connect with his his erasure and and his the 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 assimilation that he experienced into Israeli society. Is something that I still feel like I'm still recovering from. Uh, so, and it's layered upon layered upon layered with 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 more migration and and Ashkenazi dominance in America and, and all of these other uh, factors, colonialism. You know, it could go on and on and on and on. Um, the list of of, of fragmenting uh, forces. But I, I think he's proud, and and I, I think I think he's 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 happy to be sharing. Uh, Iraqi culture with 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 more of the Jewish community here and happy that I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if there are parallels between Jewish Persian music and Jewish Arabic music? Yeah, so Persian music, uh, I haven't studied extensively, but from what I understand, the, the, the modal structure they use is different than Maqam, which uh, Turkish music is more similar. Persian music, from what I understand, uses some of the similar similar ideas, but they call them different names. They have slightly different intonations, but they still use quarter tones, just like we do uh, in Maqam. Uh, they just have different names for everything, from what I understand, and different instruments, too. They still use the oud, but they have they have other instruments, like the kamanche, tar, um, different interesting instruments uh, in, in that musical style. That's mm -hmm. what I know about that. <laughs> uh, have you worked on any children's music and lullabies? Oh, wow, that's such a sweet question. I haven't personally. I look forward to doing that one day. Uh, I'll just lift up another artist, though, which I think is really worth listening to, is, is Yair Dalal, uh, is an Iraqi Jewish musician working, living and working in Israel. He has an album uh, that he did in collaboration with a Yiddish singer called Lenka Lichtenberg, and it's called Lullabies from Exile. And basically, they took Yiddish lullabies and Iraqi Jewish lullabies and combined them together uh, in these really beautiful arrangements. And if you're interested in children's music or lullabies, I really recommend checking out that album. Thank you. Uh, how difficult is, is it to tune your instrument and does it depend uh, upon the music? Yes, well, this instrument is particular. Oud is really hard to tune. There's 11 strings and they're, they're pegs. They're not like a, like a guitar has gears and, and gear boxes. These are just like stuck in there from tension between the wood against the wood, Same, similar to a, a violin peg. Um, and there's 11 of them and they have to match exactly. They're paired in twos. So like, I don't know if you can tell, but like two strings kind of go together, uh, except for this low one. Uh, on your left, I guess. Um, the, the, they're, they're paired together. So th they basically make the same sound. So like if I play the top string of, pa of the pair and then I play the bottom string, it should be the same note. Um, and them being tuned to the same note is what gives it that kind of twang. Like I'm playing two notes at once right now, two strings at once, but even though it's the same pitch. 
and that makes it really hard to tune because you have to make sure that they match one string to the other exactly. Um, there's other instruments that do that. The mandolin also has uh, paired strings and also a uh, 12 string guitar is similar to that. But yeah, they make a joke that um, oud players spend half the time tuning and half the time playing out of tune. <laughs> uh, that's like the joke about, about oud players. <laughs> um, in light of the growing knowledge of an interest in the wide range of Jewish musical cultural threat, Jewish musical cultural threads, do you think Jewish music in the future will develop more fusions of these different threads? Yeah, I hope so. My, as I said, I think I think my dream is that is that that we create Jewish communities and Jewish futures that are more, are more aware of the diversity of Jewish voices, and of course. I would love for that to lead into fusion. Um, I, fusion is, is an amazing tool. I also am like a little bit weary of it because it's it, oftentimes when we fuse two things together without a lot of care and love, uh, we can lose a little bit about what makes those things great and unique, uh, each one of them. Uh, and so like, for example, this music in my mind loses a little bit of something if you add harmony to it. That's just like my current opinion. Ask me again in five years, I think I might have a different idea. So like, yeah, I want fusion. I want people to take take it and run. Uh, and also like as a music nerd and like someone who's like really committed to honoring the style, I want to preserve what's really beautiful about it. So it's a complicated answer. <laughs> I don't know if you know uh, uh, the, the jazz saxophonist Lou Donaldson, but he calls bad fusion music confusion. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Had to. Um, I'm going to combine two questions here. Uh, what was it like being in the show, The Band's Visit? And the other question is, what are the opportunities of cross-cultural dialogue because you are someone who speaks Arabic and plays this music? Yeah, great question. The Band's Visit was an amazing experience. It was a role that was like really built for me in so many ways. I was an actor in the show. I was playing as one of the Egyptian orchestra members of the Alexandria Ceremonial Police Orchestra. And so I was in costume, I was on stage, I played violin, and I also had lines. I, I was a character in the show, speaking Arabic uh, and also English in an Arabic dialect uh, with, with the trying to communicate with the Israelis that we met. Uh, and it was such a special experience. First of all, uh, a beautiful show. And second of all, just an opportunity to, to really celebrate Jewish culture and Arab culture being represented on the same stage and also like a really prominent Broadway stage as well. That, that was really just such an honor to be a part of that. Um, and audiences were really so so receptive to, to, to being a part of this show and being taken on the journey with us. And it was like a very delicate uh, show with, with, with really beautiful music. Um, and I got to improvise every night. That was the best part is like most Broadway shows don't have like 16 bar solo written in the violin part. That's like for the guitar books or the saxophone books or the piano books. But this had like, you know, all these Arabic style solos that I was able to play every night. Every show was different. That was really a joy. Um, and yeah, through that show, I, I, we did a lot of cross, cross cultural dialogue. I had uh, Palestinian friends in that show that, that I shared my music with and I talked to about a lot of this stuff. And I was struck by, but to learn how much they resonated with these themes. Uh, Palestinians growing up in America fragmented from their home, many of them can't visit their ancestral land, just like my answers, like I can't visit my ancestral land in Iraq. Many of them can't visit their ancestral land and are trying to contend with the fragmenting forces of, of migration, colonialism, assimilation, and trying to see where they stand with it. And, and so I was really struck to see how much it, 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 uh, they resonated with the music. And it was powerful to be able to see that and to be able to in my dreams, I would really love to be able to perform this music for Arab audiences and Jewish audiences, and maybe even at the same time, uh, would be really wonderful. And, and I think there's a lot of power in seeing beauty in the other. Uh, and I would love to bring more of that uh, into my performance spaces. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to need to wrap up. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, one last question is, what's next for you? Um, wh what do you hope to do uh, in, in the coming year? Yeah, so Fragments was just released uh, a month or two ago. I've been working hard to publicize it, uh, and I am excited to begin performing it live uh, across the country uh, and, and across the world. So um, that would be my next thing, like the next thing I'm looking forward to. I'm, I'm also currently writing music like I always am, and, and uh, I, have new, I have a new collaboration with a saxophone player, Zach Mayer, who, who, that I'm working on right now. Um, 
and thinking about what the next album would be. But um, really what I'm looking forward to is, is being able to connect with, with all of you and maybe even in Atlanta one day um, to, to be able to really uh, share with you this music in a live setting to be able to experience the magic of coming together in a room and experiencing something beautiful together at the same time. Um, so I would say if you want to keep up with what I'm doing and if you, if you maybe want to be in that magical room with me, uh, I would say uh, join my email list, which you can do through my website, um, yonibatat.com. Or follow me on social media, Yoni Avi Batat, uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And um, really, my goal is just to connect with all of you. And, and so, so any any opportunity that we that we could have to connect uh, and to and to share beauty together would would be amazing for me. Great. Well, thank you, Yoni. Thank you, Joe, for this great conversation. Thank you for introducing all of us to this music. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I will be sending out an email with links both to Yoni and Joe's websites uh, where you can learn more. Uh, again, sign up for our January program where uh, David Broza will be singing music and talking about um, excuse me, talking about Leonard Cohen. And uh, that's at momentmag.com. We wish everybody a happy Hanukkah and a happy holidays and a healthy new year. And we'll see everybody next time. Thank you again. Bye-bye.